introduction, aren't I? So I first heard about this dynamic duo when I wrote a letter to Gene about ooh, 30 years ago asking him if he knew anybody who was into focusing and spirituality. So he wrote me back and says, well, you have to look up Pete and Ed. They're the guys who are really into this. So I contacted them, and they told me about a workshop they were doing, and I signed up for their workshop. And I can't tell you how impressed I was with their workshop, how clearly they articulated the connection between focusing and spirituality. I was just really touched in a really deep way by that. And not only focusing on Christian spirituality, I might add, but more, more centrally, a bio-spirituality, a global spirituality that transcends denominational divisions. Because I was into the whole ecumenical thing, and they really embodied that for me. So then I read their incredible book, Bio-Spirituality, Focusing as a Way to Grow, and I was really blown away by the book. And after reading that and doing their workshop, I soon became their focusing students, and they became my main focusing teachers. So what's touched me the most is not just what they teach, but how they embody what they teach, right? Because we all know people who speak well, but they don't really embody it very well in their lives. You know people like that? Yeah. Well, Pete and I really impressed me with people who are living their talk. Now, just a little background, as Jesuits, they were very much influenced by the renowned theologian and paleontologist Teilhard de Chardin. Now, he was a stretcher bearer during World War I. So Teilhard had a vision for an institute that would study what he called human energetics. He wanted to explore the question, are there inner resources within us that if brought to the surface might make it possible to grow beyond our destructive tendencies? So there's some, something organic, some spiritual energy for life inside of us that can be awakened to guide us into a transformed way of living. Well, sad to say, Teilhard never created such an institute. But 20 years later, guess what happened? Along came Peter Ned. And they founded the Institute for Biospiritual Research a nonprofit foundation that has a lot of international reach. So now enter Eugene Genwin. When Ed and Pete encountered Gene's research, a, a light bulb really went off for them. They've been familiar with the work of Carl Rogers, you know, who identified the importance of being congruent, expressing feelings in a way that is connected to how we're actually experiencing them. And then he encountered Gene's work regarding the inner experiencing process. And they realized that the inner experiencing process formed the foundation for congruent living. And they recognized that Gene's term, the felt sense, captured something that was essential not only for our emotional, for our emotional well-being, but something that was really essential for our spiritual development as well. So they began to envision a spirituality that tapped into the body's own knowing potential which in turn connected us with a larger living process. So I can only imagine the rich discussions that Pete and Ed had as, the, as they were classmates at the University of Ottawa in Canada. They brought together their backgrounds in psychotherapy, the psychological investigation of religion, philosophy, and Christian theology. And they created a profound synthesis of all of that. They recognize the cultivating what, what they now call the habit of felt sensing. I love that term, the habit of felt sensing, was the key to Teilhard's vision. The habit of felt sensing is the key to Teilhard's vision of a human evolution toward a more whole and connected and peace-loving human being. That's some of the folklore about how Pete and Ed met Jean, how they became interested. It was in the late 1960s they were completing their doctoral work, and Pete showed an article to Ed. And after reading it, Ed was so moved that he said, he said to Pete, Pete, we've got to find this guy and talk to him. They had no idea where he was. So they were able to, the good researchers, you know, because they were, you know, studied theology for many years, they were in graduate school, they wrote their doctoral dissertations. So being good researchers, they figured out he was in Manhattan. 
pretty big city, but they didn't find somebody. And it was midwinter, they were in the California mountains. But after a few weeks, they found out that Gene was in New York on a sabbatical. No doubt trying to escape people like them. <laughs> who were trying to find them. So it's not easy to fly all the way from California to New York when you're not sure where somebody lives. Not sure you have the right address. Not sure he's going to open the door if you come and visit him. So it's rather gutsy. So arriving in New York, they went to where they thought he lived, knocked on the door of the apartment building, rang the bell, with great trepidation, and then Jean opened the door. And there stood two young priests in their clerical suits and collars. <laughs> Maybe a little naive at that time. So they told him who they were, why they, that they'd come out to California just to see him. And then they asked rather sheepishly, can we come up and talk to you for just a little while? So they, Gene invited them in, only to discover that there was no place for the three of them to sit in Gene's apartments. <laughs> rather sparse lifestyle. So he quickly found two crates, and he put two rug samples on the crates. And they sat on top. Gene sat on the couch, on the sofa, asked them what they wanted to talk about. So as they began to ask their questions, the reason that they came out, Gene held up his hand for them to stop. And watching Gene close his eyes, and breathing heavily, and going completely silent, in the middle of a conversation, Pete and Ed looked at each other with glances that said, what have we gotten ourselves into here? <laughs> so then just as suddenly, just as suddenly as it disappeared into silence, he opened his eyes and said to them, okay, you guys are okay. You can continue, you feel okay. <laughs> so obviously Gene was focusing on how it felt to continue the conversation. That's what I'm surmising, right? Well, whether to throw you guys out. <laughs> but fortunately, he was magnanimous, and he allowed you to continue. So Gene asked, okay, what's your question? What do you want to talk about? So they asked the most important question that they brought to New York. Do the steps that you call focusing make the felt shift happen? Do the, do the steps you call focusing make the felt shift happen? Or is there another factor at work here? After a short pause, he said, no, the steps don't make it happen. That's what, that's what you guys would call grace, a gift factor. And Ed and Pete replied, then we're in business. <laughs> He said, if my stuff is getting through, Gene said, if my stuff is getting through, a big part of that is your work. You've enriched so many in the focusing community. So I feel very touched to be here. Let's warmly welcome Peter King.
which lies within each and every one of us. And our bodies themselves offer the keys which open this unfolding dimension of awareness within human evolving. So on behalf of both Ed and myself, we want to thank you all for your kind attention and especially for inviting us to speak at this conference. Both of us hope to remain vertical long enough <laughs> to continue our journey with you into the farther, farther reaches of what yet lies, lies ahead for focusing explorers. Something which we express in our own language as a bio-spiritual journey of exploration into God. Thank you.